Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vantage Seminar. So um, come into the room virtually. And uh, today we're continuing our, our series of talks on unitary Shimura varieties in characteristic P. And we're gonna have Maria Fox talking about super singular loci in some unitary Shimura varieties. And Maria, is it all right if we record this talk? Yes, that's fine, thank you. Wonderful, yeah, and feel free to ask uh, short questions during the talk. Oh, yes, please go I'll, ahead. I'll do my best. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be speaking here today. Uh, and we will be talking about super singular loci of unitary Shamora varieties. Um, but just because I know we have a mix of people in the audience, I thought I'd start with a motivational example. And the motivational example is the modular curve. So uh, one could try to understand the collection of all elliptic curves over FP bar in some organized way. And we have a very nice way of doing this. It's the J invariant, which I believe is due to either Dedekind or Klein back in the 1800s, who show that there's a bijection between this collection of all elliptic curves over FP bar and the field FP bar itself. Given an elliptic curve, you compute its J invariant. And given a J invariant, we can always write down an elliptic curve um, with that particular J invariant. So we can think of this as a geometric way of organizing our collection of elliptic curves into a moduli space, meaning we can study the line itself, drawn like this, this is FP bar, as our moduli space. That is a topological space with the property that for every point J in this topological space, we have exactly one elliptic curve EJ, and for every elliptic curve, we have exactly one point in this topological space. So that's our moduli space of elliptic curves over FP bar. And what we'll be doing in the talk today is replacing these elliptic curves with abelian varieties with extra structure. So our moduli space is going to be significantly more complicated than just the line. And we're going to try to study some of the structure of this moduli space. So in particular, uh, we're replacing the elliptic curves with abelian varieties. Um, so we're throughout this talk going to fix a quadratic imaginary field K and a prime not equal to two. I think this seminar series is in Shamor varieties and characteristic P. So this is the P for our characteristic. We're going to assume that this prime is inert in the field K. Um, there's nothing wrong with letting the prime also be split or ramified in the field K, but for concreteness, we're going to uh, stick to the inert case. Then our Shamor variety, which is the replacement for our modular curve, instead of being a moduli space of elliptic curves, will be a moduli space of abelian varieties with extra structure. So our abelian varieties will have fixed dimension. It's the sum of these integers, a plus b. And the extra structure they have, most importantly, is an action of some order inside our quadratic imaginary field. They come with other structure too, a polarization and level structure. And uh, if you're curious, the polarization is always hyperspecial at P and given, um, sorry, the level structure is always uh, hyperspecial at P and given by a sufficiently small subgroup um, away from P. Um, but we're going to mostly ignore these two pieces of data throughout the talk. So uh, this is our, our moduli space. We're trying to understand abelian varieties with an action, uh, but not just any action. We put a condition called the signature AB condition. Uh, even though we'll be talking about abelian varieties mostly in characteristic P, I think it's easiest to understand this with the example of the complex numbers. So imagine for the moment that our abelian varieties are defined over C and they're of our fixed dimension, A plus B. Then it's Lie algebra is now a complex vector space, also of dimension A plus B. And there's two embeddings of our quadratic imaginary field into the complex numbers, call them uh, phi one and phi two. And the signature condition just says, we have an action on our abelian variety. So there's an induced action on this complex vector space. And we want this induced action to sort of act through the first embedding on A dimensions of this complex vector space and B dimensions uh, through the second embedding on B dimensions. And similarly, uh, sort of over another field or over a general base scheme. So that's what the signature condition is. Another way to understand this is by making a silly example of an abelian variety with a particular signature condition. You can do that by taking products of elliptic curves. So here is uh, one elliptic curve that has an action of the Gaussian integers. So that's going to be our order inside um, our field K. 
And this has an action on E given by coordinates just like this. Then we can take our abelian variety of dimension three to be a product of three copies of this elliptic curve. And we can create an induced action by having the element I act maybe just as I does on the first elliptic curve, but maybe as minus I on the next two. And that will produce an action of signature one, two. So that's a silly example of a signature one, two abelian variety. So this is how we can think about the signature condition. And I want to point out, it would be nice if we could study just abelian varieties with an action of a quadratic imaginary field with no further conditions. That would be a really nice sort of moduli problem. But the problem is, if you do that, our moduli space is not only disconnected, uh, the connected components have different dimensions, and they're fundamentally very different from each other. So the signature condition is cutting out sort of a particular type of connected component. Um, even though it might still be disconnected, it's, it's cutting out, uh, it's eliminating this non-equal dimension problem. Uh, so it's important we have a signature condition to sort of focus on one type of abelian variety with action. So that's our moduli problem. Are there any questions about this before I move on? I can't see your faces. Um, maybe if I do this, there we go. So now I can see some of your faces. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, looks good. This is our moduli problem. Um, and just like before, we were studying uh, elliptic curves in characteristic P. So we're most curious about these abelian varieties in characteristic P. So this will be our notation to remind us that we're studying this moduli space in characteristic P. And now instead of being our modular curve, which was dimension one, this moduli space will be dimension A times B. So much larger. So if only because of the dimension reasons, it's a lot harder to say anything useful about the geometry of the space. It just gets larger and larger as the signature increases. So this is my best picture of our moduli space that I can draw. Um, so that's our, that's our starting object. Now that we know um, what object we're studying, I wanna lay out the objectives for the rest of this talk. And I'll give these definitions as we go, but just so you know, we're sort of comparing in this talk two different stratifications of this moduli space. The first will be the Newton stratification. And among all these strata, there's a simplest one called the super singular locus, which we'll focus on. So we're going to try to describe the geometry of the super singular locus in several examples. And by geometry, I mean simple questions like what is the dimension? What do the irreducible components look like? How do they interact with each other? Then we'll see how the general behavior uh, differs from our sort of low dimensional first examples. They're sort of uh, uh, you can trick yourself if you study only the low dimensional examples into thinking the situation is simpler than it is. Then we're going to turn our attention at the end of the talk to another stratification called the Ectolart stratification and see how in some examples this can really inform the geometry of the super singular locus. However, unfortunately, in the general case, uh, the, the relationship is much more mysterious. So that's our general layout. So let's get started with our first objective, the Newton stratification. Oh, Maria, um, oh, yeah. uh, one question in the chat about whether the Shimura variety has an integral model. Yes, good question. So uh, the Shimura variety absolutely has an integral model. We're taking the integral model of Kotwitz that we have because of our assumptions on the level structure. And then we're taking the fiber at P of that integral model. So if A is not equal to B, the integral model is defined over OK. Um, and if A is equal to B, then the integral model is defined over uh, just C localized at P. Thank you, good question. But we're taking the fiber at P either way, and then I'll take the geometric fiber for, sim for simplicity. So in particular, it's a scheme over FP bar. All right, so back to the modular curve. Uh, as we know, elliptic curves over FP bar come fundamentally in two types, ordinary and super singular. And there's many different ways we can define these two properties. And uh, for the purpose of the Newton stratification for the moment, I'd like us to forget that we ever saw the definition that involves the p-torsion. Um, in the previous talk, uh, Elena Montavan was telling us about the slopes, and that's the definition we want to focus on. So if you've seen that definition of ordinary and super singular, uh, that's sort of the perspective I'd like to take. Another way of defining it is from our elliptic curve, we can define its p-divisible group. So you take the P to the K torsion, not the points, but the group scheme itself. We have to do that because we know for super singular elliptic curves, they don't have very interesting P torsion points, just the identity. 
So we take the group schemes and then we package them all together in the direct limit, all the P to the K torsion group schemes. That's the P divisible group of our elliptic curve. <clears throat> and we say that two elliptic curves are in the same Newton stratum, <clears throat> sorry, if their P divisible groups are isogenous. And it turns out if we make this definition, our modular curve divides exactly into two Newton strata, the ordinary and the super singular. So here's just a repeat of that. Our moduli space has two Newton strata. So we knew that our moduli space of elliptic curves could be identified with FP bar via the J invariant. For every J, we have one elliptic curve EJ. And now we know we have two Newton strata, those ordinary elliptic curves and those super singular elliptic curves. So we can ask, what does the stratification look like? And that was answered by a corollary to the Eichler during mass formula that says there's approximately P over 12 super singular elliptic curves, in particular, finitely many out of all of our possible J invariants. So our super singular locus consists of those approximately P over 12 points. So that's our super singular locus, these uh, finitely many points. And the ordinary locus, our other stratum, is the complement. So this is our prototype for our moduli space and characteristic P and our super singular locus. We can make uh, the same construction for our unitary Shimura variety. Remember now it's parameterizing abelian varieties of our fixed dimension and our action of our quadratic imaginary field, et cetera. And we can make the same definition based on the isogeny class of the P divisible group. Um, and this will divide our moduli space now not into two, but into several different strata, but it will still have a unique closed Newton stratum. And that's the super singular locus. We can also define it as those points A, Iota, Lambda, Eta, where just A is super singular. As an abelian variety, uh, one way of saying that is isogenous to a product of super singular elliptic curves. And out of all the Newton strata, this is the unique closed one. So in that sense, it's the simplest one. So if we want to define the geometry, it's a natural place to start. So what we'd like to do is describe the geometry of this unique closed locus, uh, in particular, like what are the irreducible components? Uh, before we see some examples, I want to sum up the history of the problem. Uh, so the first thing to notice is that the, the signature AB Shimor variety is isomorphic to the signature BA Shimor variety. So we can always assume that B is greater than or equal to A. So A is the smaller of the two. Um, and then here's the history of the problem. Signature zero M, these Shimura varieties are zero dimensional. So not a, lot of, uh, not a lot of geometry to describe. Signature one one, again, our super singular locus is zero dimensional. So not much to say, but uh, signature one two is the first non-trivial case studied. This was studied by Ballard in 2008. Her results were extended to the general signature 1m minus 1 case in 2010. Signature 2, 2 was studied by Howard and Pappas in 2014. Signature 2m minus 2 was studied in 2021 after applying the perfection um, operator to this. And uh, removing that assumption is current work in progress. And then beyond that, uh, as far as I know, there's sort of very incomplete results. So something I want to point out is that the signature becomes more difficult as A increases. So sort of the simplest of these Shimura varieties are the signature 0m. The next simplest are 1m minus 1. After that is 2m minus 2, 3m minus 3, et cetera. So signature, for example, 0, 100 is, uh, results in a much simpler moduli space, a zero-dimensional moduli space versus like signature 3, 4. So that's how to think about the complexity here. And that's reflected in the order in which these super singular loci were studied. So we're going to focus on three examples for motivation, signature one, two, signature two, two, which was the first one studied of this type, uh, besides the cases, you know, zero, two was done here, and one, two is the same as two, one. So those were studied. So this was the first interesting two M minus two case. And then as a more general example, we'll study two, three as well. So these will be our three prototypes. So let's get started. Uh, signature one, two. Uh, remember this moduli problem is parameterizing abelian varieties of dimension three, an action of our quadratic imaginary field. So there's an action of K, meeting the signature one, two condition on the Lie algebra, polarization and level structure. So Vollard shows that each irreducible component is isomorphic to a Fermat curve. So now inside our two dimensional moduli space, our super singular locus is one dimensional. And it's uh, fundamentally built out of Fermat curves. So something like this. 
and then they intersect in some combinatorial way. Each Fermat curve uh, has p cubed plus one special points on it. And through each of these special points pass p plus one other Fermat curves, p plus one total Fermat curves. So they intersect in some nice combinatorial way like this. So that's our first example. Here's our second example. Now we've increased the dimension of our abelian varieties to dimension four. Our action uh, of the quadratic imaginary field K meets the signature 2, 2 condition, polarization and level structure. Now our moduli space is four dimensional and inside it, our super singular locus is two dimensional. And it's fundamentally made up of Fermat surfaces. This is a result of Howard and Pappas. So here's one Fermat surface but now they can intersect in a couple different ways. They might intersect in a projective line. Here's two surfaces intersecting in a projective line, or they might intersect in a single point. So here's two Fermat surfaces uh, intersecting in that single point. And again, there's some combinatorial behavior that Howard and Pappas describe. So I wanna point out that these two uh, types of irreducible component, Fermat surface and Fermat curve, they're notable, uh, not just being from a hypersurfaces, but because there's something called delene lustig varieties, which we'll see a lot in our talk today. So I think of delene lustig varieties fundamentally as moduli spaces of flags and characteristic p-vector spaces that have some fixed relative position to their Frobenius twist. So they have a general definition that's sort of group theoretic, given a group over any finite field, but for us, we'll just say it's FP, a Borel subgroup and an element of the vial group, you can define a delene lustig variety like this. Those cosets in G mod B, such that this conditions holds. And we can think of this as G and its Frobenius twist have relative position W. So as a simple example, we can take G to be SL2, B to be the upper triangular uh, Borel, and then our vial group has two elements, the trivial element and a non-trivial element. We can identify uh, G mod B as the space of lines inside a two-dimensional uh, vector space by having a matrix A, B, C, D uh, acting on, say, the first basis vector E1. And then as we study the space of lines in our two-dimensional vector space, they also have a notion of relative position. Two lines have the trivial relative position if and only if they're equal, and otherwise they have the non-trivial relative position. There's also a notion of Frobenius twist. Given a line, we can act by Frobenius by simply acting on its coefficients. Putting this together, we have two delene lustig varieties. The first one are those elements in G mod B, that is the lines in our two-dimensional vector space, with the property that the line and its Frobenius twist have the trivial relative position. That is, the line is equal to its Frobenius twist, or in other words, is defined over the base field. So this cuts out exactly the FP points of P1. On the other hand, we could have taken the non-trivial relative position. That will be the lines in our two-dimensional vector space uh, with non-trivial relative position to their Frobenius twist that is not defined over the base field. So these are our two prototypes. And this Fermat surface and Fermat curve are also two examples of delene lustig varieties. However, something interesting happens when we increase the signature now to two, three. So now our abelian varieties are dimension five. We have an action that meets the signature two, three, condition on the Lie algebra, polarization and level structure. Now our moduli space is dimension six and our super singular locus is dimension three. Uh, so I can't draw very many pictures for you of this, but in this case, now we have multiple isomorphism classes of irreducible components, call them X1 and X2. X1 is isomorphic to a delene lustig variety, very analogous to what we've seen before. But X2 is interesting in that it's not. Uh, however, we can describe it concretely via a map to a delene lustig variety. Uh, so this is joint work in progress uh, with Howard and Amai, uh, based on a previous project uh, with Amai. Um, yes, so this is what looks different in signature 2-3. So these are our three prototype examples. What I'd like to do next is um, introduce the main technique for studying super singular loci, how we came up um, with these, how uh, these authors came up with these descriptions, explain why we might expect delinustic varieties, why that's a reasonable thing to hope for, and then explain what goes wrong in signature two, three, and beyond. Before I do that, are there any questions? Well, just a, a quick one. So just to make sure I understand the 
the particular quadratic field you're working with doesn't matter at all, right? Or Exactly. All that matters is the relation between the particular quadratic field and the prime P. So it depends on if the prime P is inert, split, or ramified. Um, I summarized only the results where the prime P is inert because that's the case where most is known. There are some results where the prime P is split and ramified as well, though. But you're right, the geometry only depends on this relation between P and the field, not really on the field itself. Okay, so let's carry on. Uh, here's our main technique. It's the study of Rappaport zinc spaces. Uh, and the way I think about this is our original moduli space. This is a moduli space of abelian varieties with action, polarization, and level structure. And if we uh, are setting the super singular locus, we're assuming our abelian varieties are super singular. We talked about the p-divisible group as cutting out the Newton strata. And the Rappaport zinc space is what you get when you replace all your abelian varieties with their p-divisible groups and their induced structure. So take our abelian variety, it's of dimension A plus B, replace it with its p-divisible group, and we get a p-divisible group of dimension A plus B. It's super singular because we are assuming A is super singular. We had an action on our abelian variety, so now we're going to have an action on our p-divisible group. We had our polarization on our abelian variety, so now we have induced polarization on the p-divisible group. We forget the level structure, but we add in one more piece of data, which is we fix a base point such object, a favorite p-divisible group with action and polarization, and we require all the varying ones, all of these, to have a fix, to have a map to our fixed base point. It's sort of rigidifying structure. And this map is defined to be a quasi-isogeny, at least over um, FP bar, that's an isogeny that's been formally divided by some powers of P. So an extra bit of structure, um, a map to a fixed base point. Uh, so Rappaport zinc uniformization tells us essentially we can study the geometry of our super singular locus by studying the geometry of Rappaport zinc spaces. And this is called uniformization because I hope it might remind you of the study of elliptic curves over C by looking at the upper half plane modulo SL2Z. So it's uniformization maybe in that style. Uh, but the takeaway is we can replace our abelian varieties with p-divisible groups and study those instead. And the reason we might want to do that is because these p-divisible groups are significantly more linear algebraic than our starting abelian varieties, and so will be easier to study. So let me justify that for you. We have p adic to Denae theory. In the first talk in this series, I believe we saw some mod p to Denae theory. Uh, this is the p adic version of that, so it's related but not the same. So given our p-divisible groups with our action, we can replace them, there's an equivalence of category, uh, to p adic to Denae modules. So uh, we'll replace G iota lambda with a free module over this ring ZP brevet. If we take uh, the p adic numbers QP, we can take its maximal unramified extension, take the completion of that. Then we have a ring of integers in that, and that's ZP brevet. But if you haven't seen this before, it's a ring that acts very similar to just the p adic integer ZP. So it's a free module over our p adic ring of a fixed uh, size. There's a condition that has all slopes one half reflecting the fact that G is super singular. It has an action because G had an action. It has some sort of Hermitian form on it because we had a polarization. So we don't need to understand the details of this, but I just want to explain to you that fundamentally these p-divisible groups are linear algebraic objects that we can understand by essentially studying uh, lattices or free modules over a p-adic ring, ZP. Um, so in particular, uh, and then we can use our map to the base point to put all of these varying modules inside one vector space. So this will be a vector space over this completion of the unramified extension of dimension 2a plus b. So it really is linear algebraic in nature. We're studying a bunch of varying lattices inside one fixed vector space. And even though there's quite a bit of linear algebraic data, it's still simpler than our original problem of studying p-divisible groups or before that studying abelian varieties. So that's the reason why we might want to use Rappaport zinc uniformization. So our next, uh, oh, and this is a technique that Vollard used uh, studying the signature 1-2 Shamor variety. So now the Rappaport zinc space is parameterizing these p-divisible groups of dimension three that are super singular with an action of signature 1-2. So there's an action of K. Um, a polarization and a map to the base point. 
And uh, she shows that this Rappaport zinc space first decomposes by a particular index set. They're called vertex lattices. If you've seen this before, these are given by vertices in a certain Bruja Tits building, though we won't get into the details of that today. But through each of these types of lattices, you can cut out an irreducible component. And one part of the trade off of studying Rappaport zinc spaces is now there's infinitely many irreducible components. Uh, but they're all isomorphic. And they're all isomorphic exactly to this Fermat curve we saw before, which makes sense because the geometry of the Rappaport zinc space is supposed to reflect the geometry of the super singular locus. And there are also further results, but I just want to focus on, on these two parts of her result. Uh, similarly, for signature 2-2, studied by Howard Pappas, uh, now it's a moduli space of p divisible groups of dimension 4. Again, an action of our field, meaning the signature 2-2. Signature 2-2, two, two. Uh, polarization and map to the base point. And though I should emphasize their techniques are very different, there is significant complications here. The result is quite similar. You can study these vertex lattices. Each vertex lattice will cut out an irreducible component. Each irreducible component is a delinistic variety. So I'd like to justify for you uh, why we think this approach might work and then explain what goes wrong. So this is an oversimplification. I hope you don't mind. Uh, we'll focus on the signature one, two case. So the first step um, in Vollard's work is to replace our p-adic DNA module. Sorry, replace our p-divisible group with our p-adic DNA module. That's the whole reason for studying these is they're so linear algebraic. Our p-divisible groups were dimension three. So our p-adic DNA modules are dimension six, free of rank six over ZP brevet. And then as we said before, we can view them as varying lattices inside one fixed vector space. There's a QP breve vector space of dimension six. And because they're coming from p-divisible groups, it's not arbitrary lattices, they'll have some conditions. So this is our first step. And remember that delene lustig varieties are supposed to be moduli spaces of flags in characteristic P vector spaces. And so far, we have lattices in a p adic vector space. So we're not quite looking at the right thing. But how we can go from something p adic to something characteristic p is reduce modulo p. And that's essentially the approach. So there's a very technical point, which is you have to convert to a different p adic vector space, which we'll ignore for the moment. But we're replacing this now. This will be a p adic vector space of dimension 3. Uh, but again, we're going to get lattices with some conditions with respect to Frobenius. And then we're going to cut out these irreducible components as those varying lattices that are sandwiched between a vertex lattice and P times a vertex lattice. And it turns out that all of our varying lattices can be sandwiched in this way between some vertex lattice and P times that vertex lattice, which is great because we're hoping to go from something p adic to something characteristic P. We need to reduce modulo P and that's how we can do it on this irreducible component, because L is always between lambda and P times lambda, we can replace L with L mod P lambda, thereby moving from a p-adic vector space to a characteristic p vector space of dimension three. And because we started way at the beginning with P divisible groups or p-adic to DNA modules, we're not going to get arbitrary, in this case, lines. We're going to get lines with specific conditions with respect to Frobenius. And that's exactly what we're looking for for delinistic varieties, flags in a characteristic p vector space with conditions with respect to Frobenius. So this is our prototype approach. And it sort of makes sense. Uh, we're sort of using this sandwiching between a lattice and p times the lattice to go from p adic to characteristic p. And a similar approach works for signature 2, 2, though I should emphasize this middle step is very different for the Howard Pappas result. But as I pointed out, something goes wrong in signature 2-3. So that's what I'd like to discuss next. In signature 2-3, now we're studying p divisible groups of dimension 5. We have an action of k of signature 2-3 on the Lie algebra. We have a polarization and a map to the base point. We're studying that moduli space. And we can attempt to do the same thing. We can study an appropriate type of vertex lattices, and we can cut out uh, what we hope to be irreducible components based on those. However, now we are no longer gonna cut out just one irreducible component. Each of these pieces will further decompose into say a one piece and a two piece. The first piece really will be an irreducible component and it will be a delinistic variety. 
very analogous to what we've seen before. The second piece, its closure will be an irreducible component and it will not be a delinguistic variety, but we can describe it sort of analogously via a map to an appropriate delinguistic variety. So let's see what goes wrong with this approach when we move from dimension three or four p divisible groups to dimension five. Uh, to do that, I need a little bit of notation. This is the notation we've been using so far. QP brevet is what we get when we take this unramified extension of QP and complete it with a ring of integers. But you can replace that with ZP and QP if you want. W will be a particular fixed five-dimensional vector space, p at a vector space. It comes with a Hermitian form. For any lattice, we'll do L check as the dual lattice. Those are the elements W and W that pair integrally uh, with all elements of our lattice, not pair to zero. And then we're going to fix a particular self-dual lattice, lambda. That will be our vertex lattice. We need one more piece of notation. It's the relative position. So given two lattices in any p vector space, we can talk about their relative position invariant. It's not the same, but it's similar to the relative position we saw for flags. Um, so we say L2 has relative position compared to L1, given by a tuple of five integers. If there's some basis of L1, such that L2 is the span of those basis vectors just scaled by these powers of our uniformizer. So it's not the fact that L1 and L2 are somehow diagonal. Uh, that will actually always happen. We can always find a sort of diagonal basis. It's recording the powers we need in this diagonal basis. So for example, uh, now I guess I've moved from dimension five to dimension three for the moment. Here's one lattice, free over ZP brevet. Uh, rank three, and we can make a second lattice by scaling our first basis vector by p squared. Then the relative position of L2 with respect to L1 is given by 2, 0, 0, because we have two powers of the uniformizer. But we could have instead scaled the first and second basis vectors just by p. That will have relative position 1, 1, 0. So it's sort of capturing more information than a similar thing you might have seen, uh, say a condition like this of an index of PL1 inside L2. Oops, I think I got that wrong. Uh, da, 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 this is one and this is two. Sorry, my mistake. L2 inside L1. So it's more specific condition than some sort of index. It's explaining how it has index one or two in one of these containments. So with that notation, we can explain what goes wrong. As before, our general technique is in studying the super singular locus, the whole point of studying p divisible groups is because they're linear algebraic. We can replace our p divisible group that is super singular and of dimension five with a p-adic Dodonet de module. This will be rank 10 over ZP brevet. And we can view them all inside a 10 dimensional QP brevet vector space. And as before, they're not arbitrary lattices, they're lattices with specific conditions with respect to the Frobenius operator, this action, polarization, et cetera. And then, uh, as before, there is a technical middle step where we have to convert to a different Hermitian space, uh, but it's still a piatic vector space. Uh, we're going to reduce now to dimension five. But again, we have piatic lattices inside our piatic vector space, and we wish we could reduce them mod p to get flags in a in a characteristic p vector space to cut out a point in a delinguistic variety. So we can attempt to do the same thing. We can take our vertex lattice and study those lattices L sandwiched between, but unfortunately now not sandwiched between P lambda and lambda, but sandwiched between P lambda and one over P lambda. And that's the best we can do. That's the best way we can hope to capture all of the lattices inside our Rappaport zinc space, which causes a big problem. Now, when we try to reduce mod P, the best we can do is to get some submodule inside, uh, oops, one over P lambda, modulo P lambda, which is not a vector space. We just have p squared to be zero here, not p to be zero. Um, and even worse, we don't just get one type of lattice L, they fundamentally come in two flavors. So there's two problems with our previous approach. So uh, just to explain sort of what goes wrong with these two approaches, uh, here we have uh, the sort of piece we're trying to cut out based on this vector uh, vertex lattice lambda. I've just rephrased here on the new side, it's the same thing. Here are the specific conditions we get that I was sort of hiding before. So they can be written quite simply. Um, they're just lattices inside our five-dimensional 
QP vector space, QP breve vector space, that are sandwiched between our vertex lattice and one over P, sorry, P times the vertex lattice and one over P times the vertex lattice with one relative position condition uh, between the lattice and its dual under some Hermitian form. But unfortunately, it breaks down into two pieces. There's two ways that the lattice can relate to the base point. It can either have this first relative position or the second relative position. If we focus on the first one for a second, that's saying that our vertex lattice has some basis, E1, E2, up to E5, so that our varying lattice L, so this is lambda, looks like this, so that L looks like um, 1 over P E1, E2, up to E5. So we just scale one of our basis vectors. Then we can see that L will be hidden between lambda and 1 over P times lambda. Uh, it's slightly different than we saw before, but imagine, call this lambda prime. Then it's between P lambda prime and lambda prime, which is what we were hoping for. This is the way we can go mod P, and we can get a flag, in this case a line, inside a characteristic P vector space again. And this will exactly cut out a Delinostig variety, very analogous to everything we've seen before. The problem is the other piece, uh, whose closure is our second type of irreducible component. Now, if we look at this relative position, uh, say lambda has, our vertex lattice has some basis E1 through E5. This is saying L looks like it has a basis P E1, E2, E3, 1 over P E4, 1 over P E5. So we can't fit it between the base point and P times the base point or the base point and one over P times the base point. There's nothing we can do. It's always just between one over P lambda. Oops, sorry, P lambda and one over P lambda. That's the best we can do. However, we can uh, sort of replace L with two approximations of L. One is by taking L intersect lambda. That will be guaranteed to be contained inside lambda. So now we're looking at a, a chain condition we were hoping for. Or we could take the lattice spanned by L and this vertex lattice lambda. And that will again sort of uh, live between the vertex lattice and one power away of the vertex lattice. And that turns out to be uh, the sort of thing to do. If we replace our lattice L with this intersection and the span, uh, that will define a map to a Delinostig variety. So in this case, our irreducible component is dimension three. The Delinostig variety we can describe concretely as dimension two, and the fibers are dimension one. So that's the way we can describe this irreducible component, fundamentally replacing this lattice L with its two sort of approximations to create a map to a Delinostig variety. Uh, so that's what goes wrong in signature two, three, and how we can sort of fix it by, instead of being isomorphic to a, Delin to a Delinostig variety, at least creating a morphism to one. So just to remind you of what we've seen so far, uh, we were setting the super singular loci, so these are abelian varieties that happen to be super singular with our action polarization and level structure. We argued that the best way to study the super singular locus is to replace our abelian varieties with p-divisible groups, action, polarization, et cetera. Um, I think I said map to the base point instead of level structure. Level structure eta. Uh, we replaced our abelian varieties with p-divisible groups. And then that was the technique we used to study these super singular loci. We focused on signature one, two, signature two, two, and for example, signature two, three. We saw in these lower dimensional examples, our irreducible components were always Delinostig varieties. However, this failed in signature two, three, and that's actually more like the general situation. Uh, that's more like the general situation. So signature two M minus two can be described very similarly. And in fact, uh, based on results, I'll discussed at the end by Gortz and Hu, we don't expect Delinostig varieties to occur any farther beyond 2, 2. So really this more complicated situation we saw is what we would expect to be the more general situation. There's a question in the chat, why do we need the super singular condition? Um, the, there's always p-adic uniformization theorems, uh, but the p-adic uniformization theorem is strongest on the super singular locus or the basic locus. Otherwise, you can only uniformize uh, sort of one isogeny class of your abelian variety with extra structure. So uh, that's why we're using the super singular assumption, though um, there's a more general notion of basic in which the same techniques can be used. And there's weaker uniformization theorems away from the super singular locus as well. Okay, so that's uh, 
sort of summary of what we know about the super singular loci. I think we're about to move on. Yes, when our remaining 10 minutes to talk about the ectolort stratification. Are there any further questions before we do that? Okay, so let's move on. So going back to our modular curve, what we started on, and by the way, for any maybe graduate students who might be listening, uh, we're sort of restarting. So this is a good place to jump back in, um, away from our sort of justifications about the linguistic varieties or not that we were looking at. Anyway, modular curve, moduli space of elliptic curves. We said elliptic curves and characteristic P can be ordinary or super singular. Now, uh, for this stratification, I want to focus on the first condition. We say two elliptic curves are in the same ectolort stratum if their P torsion, uh, not their P torsion points, but their P torsion group schemes are isomorphic. What's confusing about uh, the modular curve example is then the ectolort stratification happens to be the same as the Noon stratification, but in our higher dimensional examples, these are not the same. So we're going to focus on, on this definition, but it actually produces the same decomposition. So here's our modular curve again. For every point J, we have exactly one elliptic curve EJ, and it has two ectolort strata. As we saw before, there's a closed one, which consists of approximately P over 12 points and the complement. Similarly, uh, now on our unitary Shimura variety, our higher dimensional abelian varieties with action, we also have an ectolort stratification defined similarly based on the isomorphism class of the P torsion. Um, and so uh, by a result of Moonen, we know an index set for the ectolort strata. They're given by certain vial group elements. For unitary Shamor varieties, this is simply a quotient of a symmetric group. It's very concrete. Um, and for each element of our vial group, we define a particular finite group scheme with action polarization. These are normally written G, but I already used G in this talk. So these are H's, unfortunately. And we have an ectolort stratum which is those points in our characteristic P moduli space whose P torsion is isomorphic to this fixed one. So that's our ectolert stratification. And what I'd like to do is look at our same three examples and summarize some things we know about its ectolert stratification and how it interacts with the super singular locus. So as we said, this result uh, that you can index the ectolert strata is due to Moonen. We also know some about the closure relations that's due to Feynman and Vaithorn. And this particular example, one resource for, at least at this point, uh, is due to uh, the thesis of Amy Wooding. So this diagram is just saying there's three ectolort strata when we're studying abelian varieties of dimension three with an action of signature one, two on the base point and its extra structure. And the closure relations go like this. This stratum is closed. The closure of this one is this one. And the closure of this one is this one. And this one. Closure relations uh, go like so. Then uh, what I'd like to draw your attention to is that following results uh, in the paper of Vollard and Vaithorn, they described how the super singular locus interacts with the stratification. And in fact, the super singular locus is a union of exactly two strata. So it's the union of these sort of bottom two ectolord strata. And the stratification informs the geometry of the super singular locus. Meaning we saw that each irreducible component was a Fermat curve. And each Fermat curve had these special points on it. These special points are exactly the sort of lowest ectolort stratum, and their complement is the other ectolort stratum. So this stratification is informing the geometry of the super singular locus in this way. And we see the same phenomenon in signature 2, 2. Now we have several more ectolort strata, again with the same conventions, a similar picture for the closure relations. This was not uh, written explicitly in the paper of Howard and Pappas, but follows immediately from their results that the super singular locus consists of the bottom four, bottom in the sense, these four strata. Um, and again, the stratification informs the geometry. We said that two uh, Fermat surfaces sometimes meet in a single point. I guess I should draw these in purple. Sometimes meet in a single point. These single point intersections form the uh, lowest ectolord stratum, this bottom one called the super special points. But sometimes two irreducible components for mass surfaces will meet in a projective line. And if you take that projective line and subtract all of these special points, that forms the next ectolord stratum. 
And then the remaining two are these Fermat surfaces that meet in a line. So in this way, our um, super singular locus and the ector stratification are all tied up in each other. We can learn important facts about the super singular locus by studying the ector stratification. But we've learned that things get more complicated in signature two, three, and indeed they do. So uh, this is one of the results in forthcoming work uh, joint with Bamidapati, Goodson, Grun, Nair, Stacy, uh, and myself, which is we've shown exactly which ector strata intersect the super singular locus. In all previous cases, whenever an ector stratum touches the super singular locus, it's always completely contained in it. We're not saying the super singular locus is the union of these strata. We're saying these are the only strata that intersect the super singular locus. So these are the ones we would want to consider if we're trying to get some similar geometric explanation. Uh, so it's these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six strata. Um, and one of them has an interesting property we didn't see before. This stratum, uh, which we describe sort of concretely what the group scheme is corresponding to this, will intersect but is not contained in the super singular locus. Uh, what I like about this project is that the techniques are quite concrete, but we need different concrete techniques to prove sort of that each of these strata intersect the super singular locus. So for example, these two ectoric strata will intersect the sing super singular locus. And the way we do that is by comparing our unitary Shamor variety to the Ziegel modular variety. So let's see, uh, say this one, uh, this is just the index and it corresponds to some finite group scheme with action, sorry, with action and polarization. And it cuts out a stratum, those points whose p torsion is isomorphic to this thing. What we do is we take uh, this finite group scheme and we forget it ever had an action. We just study the group scheme with its polarization. Morally, what we're doing is we're taking our point from the unitary Shamor variety and we're taking the forgetful map to the Ziegel modular variety. This will cut out some ector stratum inside the Ziegel modular variety, which we happen to know is entirely contained in the super singular locus. Uh, put otherwise, we show that if we take a point that's contained in this ector stratum, then uh, end, which is to say, sorry, that it's p torsion with action and polarization is isomorphic to that one, then it's always true is super singular. Because that statement is true once we forget there ever was an action. So by comparison to the Ziegel modular variety, we can show that every point in our ectoroid stratum is actually contained in the super singular locus. But for some of the other strata, we need a different technique. So these two we can show intersect the super singular locus by comparison with unitary Shamor varieties of smaller signature. Oops. Oh no, I think I highlighted the wrong one. Sorry. So I will do my best on the recording. I think I highlighted the wrong one. Uh, it's two of them. And I think I put the wrong picture here. So I'll fix that on the recording. Uh, I think it's this one. This one will work. We can study by comparison with unitary Shamor varieties of smaller signature. This corresponds to some p-torsion group scheme with action and polarization. And it happens to be that this decomposes as a product, H, say HA times HB with a product action and a product polarization. And because we know more about these unitary Shamor varieties of smaller signature, we're able to construct a point on our Shamor variety inside our ectoler stratum, also as a product. Where both of these sort of uh, smaller product pieces are super singular. So therefore the whole thing is super singular as well. So here, uh, sort of on the level of Shamor varieties, we're setting the product map from smaller unitary Shamor varieties to ours and using facts about the interaction between ectal or strata and the super singular locus for these smaller Shamor varieties. And then for the final two strata, oh, these pictures are just flipped. Sorry about that. So imagine these two pictures are flipped. For the final two strata, say this one, we construct uh, these points by explicit construction. 
we used p addict DNA theory to write down um, a, an abelian variety by first writing down its p addict DNA module to explicitly construct a point inside the super singular locus that also is inside this ectoroid stratum. So we explicitly construct in these two remaining strata. And then finally, we rule out the other ones again by comparison to the Ziegel modular variety. So this is what I'd like to end with. Uh, we saw three motivational examples, signature one, two, 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 and two, three. Signature one, two, and two, two had this beautiful structure. Their super singular loci were all unions of delene leustig varieties. And they were also a union of ectoloid strata. And this ectoloid stratification informed the geometry of the super singular locus. These are examples of Shamor varieties of Coxer type. This phenomenon was studied by Gortz and He, and later by Gortz, He, and Ni. And they've described a finite list of all the Shamor varieties for which this occurs. And for unitary Shamor varieties, it stops at this point. So from this point and beyond, we do not expect um, our super singular loci to have this structure. So it becomes very interesting to ask, if we don't expect what we've seen in smaller signatures, what should our super singular locus look like? And how should it interact with the super uh, with the ectoloid stratification? So that's the subject of ongoing work of me and my co-authors, and we're very excited to see what happens. Thank you for your time. Wonderful. Oops. Thank you. Uh, so this would be a, a great time for questions. Um, hey, this is Jeff. Can I ask a quick question? Yes. That was really fun. Um, so this is just asking your guess for what happened. So you said that one thing that happens is, is A gets bigger, then the Shamor varieties get richer, right? Yes. And another thing that happens, as you know, is that when A and B are the same, that has us, you know, there's some things about the Shamora variety which really change as a put that distinguishes AA things from A something else. And I was wondering yes. if those issues, if you think you'll be able to see those in the structure as you move to 3 3, or if it'll be more like, is 3 3 going to be more like 2 3 but bigger, or is it going to have something similar with 2 2 because of that parallel signature? Yeah, I would expect 3 3 to be more like 2 2, but I should point out. Uh, I think proceeding from signature two comma something to three comma something is highly non-trivial. Mm -hmm. uh, there might be fundamentally new techniques, but you're right. There is this symmetry that happens in that parallel signature condition. And we can see it in the signature two two case because uh, there are these two ectolort strata, which are the same group scheme, but the opposite action. And that's what we're seeing with these two Fermat surfaces that are coming in at one projected line. So you do have this pretty structure and you would expect, I do expect, that there to be some similar nice symmetry for any parallel signature. Um, but again, I think 3-3 uh, three, three might be a long way off. Sure. Cool, thank you. Yeah. There's another question about, can we extend any of the presented results beyond the unitary case? So I can't give a great summary of the, um, of the you know, general results known at the moment, but there are similar techniques beyond the unitary case. You can talk about the Ziegel modular variety, for example, and that has a similar property in that the lowest two, I don't want to say the wrong thing, maybe G equals one and two only, or maybe G equals three. Uh, we see delene listing varieties, and then we don't see it for um, dimension higher than that. Uh, there are also, uh, there's a result of Howard and Pappas on uh, G spin Shamor varieties with similar techniques among others, I'm sure. So great, great talk, Maria. One question I had was sort of more open-ended. Uh, so the, you know, the, the Deline Lustig varieties have had such a profound impact in many areas of math. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if the linear algebra structure that you talked about today, whether you see that maybe also having a profound impact and also kind of whether you think that structure is going to persist, you know, for many more cases, or whether that is also going to die out once you get to like, you know, three, four or three, five. Great. Yeah, this is a good opportunity to point out that I've slightly uh, uh, maybe overemphasized the role of linear algebra in studying the super singular loci. The technical problem 
is really everything we've talked about is totally fine for setting the perfection of these uh, super singular loci. Uh, so the technique I discussed uh, using DID and A modules only works over a perfect field. And over a perfect field, a variety, the points of a variety and its perfection are the same. So one way I think about the perfection of these, of these super singular Locine Rappaport zinc spaces are they're the space you get if you take the perfect field valued points and then you just extend everything linearly. So in, in particular, all of our linear algebraic techniques still work. But unfortunately, to study the super singular locus itself, it's not enough to understand just the perfect field valued points. There's other pieces of technology you can use. Instead of DNA modules, you can use displays, et cetera. But it does become significantly more complicated. So that's what is happening uh, sort of in the relation between the previous paper and the current work, is we're moving that perfection assumption. Um, so I think this linear algebra technique absolutely carries forward as like a first glance at our geometric structure. But it's really only gives a complete description of the perfect field valued points, and a lot can be hidden behind that. And then removing that is uh, sort of a challenging and interesting problem. Thanks. Are there other questions here? Uh, oh, um, uh, Yu Sui says that um, they're curious about the description of the super singular locus in the ramified case. Could you say something about that case? Yes, so in the ramified case, there are some um, papers. The first is, I might not pronounce the names right, Rappaport, Tristiga, and Wilson. That's the signature one and minus one. They studied what happens when prime P is ramified. I'm so sorry, uh, I've forgotten the author's name. There's another result for signature two, two when the prime P is ramified. Um, also, so those have been discussed. Fundamentally, uh, one challenge is that you have to be careful Someone asked about uh, the integral models way back when we introduced the Shamora varieties. They asked, oh, are you taking an integral model of your, of your Shamora varieties or models? Um, and I said, we're taking the Kotwitz integral model. That works when the prime P is unramified. When the prime P is ramified, you have a couple options of which integral model to take. And uh, though I'm not an expert on the ramified case, my understanding is that in order to describe the geometry of the super singular locus, you have to first be very careful which model you take. So that's the first of many challenges, studying the ramified case. And then Hadi is asking um, whether Ort's isogeny leaves show up somewhere in this picture. Uh, yes, so uh, one isogeny leaf is the super singular locus. So that's, that's where it's appearing. And in general, we have a piatic uh, uniformization for each isogeny leaf. So that's what I was saying when you can move beyond the super singular locus, but the uniformization results are weaker. You can't uniformize the whole Newton stratum, just one leaf at a time. Wonderful, well, let's thank Maria again. Thank you so much. And our um, next talk will be on May 2nd by Sugwoo Shin.